Hello. Today I'm going to be talking about 10 books with friendships that I really, really love. This is based on a blog post which I wrote in May of 2014, and um, my second favorite author, Her Hermann Hesse, features um, four places in this list. And like some of the books, I don't know if you've like heard of them all. They're obviously my tastes aren't so like contemporary and mainstream, but like if you have heard of these books and you've read them and loved them, or even if you didn't like them, or if you've like heard of them but haven't read them yet and want to read them, please um, let me know below. And of course, I'd also appreciate comments on books about um, friendships that you have read that I didn't list that you really, really love and would recommend to other people. So let's get down with this. Um, number one is Damien by Hermann Hesse. This was a book that introduced me to Hesse at age 14 in the summer of 94. I think this was the first real adult novel I read, not counting some adult books I couldn't finish or skip the boring parts in which I read for school, like, for example, on um, The Age of Innocence and Jane Eyre. It's still like, a, I know I shouldn't really be like proud to talk about this, but I'm still like proud. I got an 82 on the test on Jane Eyre in my um, seventh grade English class, which was at the eighth grade honors level. We did a unit on like novels and we got to choose our own. I thought it'd be really cool and fun. I really didn't like it. I DNF'd it after chapter 35, but I still like passed the test with a B minus because I chose the essay portion to count as my main credit. And it was about how Jane is an early feminist. So, you know, even though I didn't finish the book, I still like, I guess, knew enough and understood enough to pass the test. And another was um The Age of Innocence, which I read for my eighth grade social studies class and got an A plus plus in the book report. I, I, I read the book, I didn't DNF it. I just skipped all the like boring flowery parts that didn't really contribute to like character development. Like, why do I care about the layout of a room or something like that? I just, you know, care about the actual plot. So anyway, Hesse, Damien by Hermann Hesse was the first adult novel, which I truly read like for my own like volition, not because I was um, made to or chose to read it for school. And I loved it so much. He, you know, became my um, second favorite author before long. And I've read all of his novels and many of his um, novellas and short stories and um, nonfiction works as well. Not quite everything by him, but like I would say like at least 90, 95% of everything he's read. I just love him so much and I can't wait until his um, books are back in my physical possession. Oh, by the way, I do own almost all the books I'm going to be discussing here, but they're 900 miles away in storage is unfortunate as I've mentioned many times I don't want to get really too personal but my um little brother has just made it clear he chooses his um toxic menage a trois over his own family and he you know treated me really really like horribly when he found out our politics are different so anyway that's just a, like a complicated like st off-topic story for another video if I ever decide to share that personal information so anyway, um, Damien features two great friendships between narrator Emil Sinclair and title character Mox Damien, and Sinclair and the mystic m musician Pistorius. Later on, there's the friendship Sinclair has with Damien's mother, Frau Eva, and one of the other reasons I love this book, as I mentioned in a previous video, it introduces what I mean, we would call in the, the Jewish community a midrash, kind of like an extrapolation or like, you know, an alternative reading or a new interpretation of like the Torah text or something in the Bible, like about the how the mark of Cain is the mark of, you know, a, a nonconformist, someone who's unafraid to be different from the others. Like um, Damien explains to um, Sinclair, like, you know, Cain wasn't, I mean, obviously he was a murderer. That's like obviously in the text, but maybe he like murdered Abel because, you know, he like, you know, stood up for things. And like Abel was this, you know, like overly conformist little wuss who never questioned anything. And that's what, you know, drove his act, obviously not to excuse murder or anything like that but you know maybe that was what motivated him even though he like he like manifested it in the wrong way and so like they cultivate this um social circle when um Sinclair moves back to town after he finishes with um his education and all these people they believe you know bear the mark of Cain they're like from a wide variety of like ethnic groups and backgrounds and such and it's a really interesting fun novel and it also introduced me to the concept of Abraxas a deity who's like half good and half evil, just so many wonderful, wonderful things I would recommend about this book. And it's under 200 pages long, so you can finish it in like a long day of reading if you're so inclined. It's not, you know, like long or heavy or complicated at all, though. It's just, you know, I, I'm sorry I'm rambling, but I just can't recommend this book enough. I've like named it as my favorite book for years. Number two, Peter Cominsent by Hermann Hesse. Published in 1904, this was Hesse's first novel. It certainly reads like a first novel, though it's very sweet in its simplicity. Of all the friendships in this book, the one that sticks out most to me is between narrator Peter and the dear older cripple Bulpy. 
Peter is initially repulsed by Bobby's appearance and disability, but they eventually become best friends. There's a very touching scene. I believe they're um, at the zoo and they're like, you know, talking about like these like funny animals and things where they suddenly realize they've switched to do the familiar you from Z, the formal you. And it's like, oh, wow, we were doing this all along for like, I don't even remember how long we switched and we didn't even realize it because, you know, they just became such good, wonderful friends. And, you know, it's always good. I love uh, intergenerational friendships. You know, sometimes they're like more interesting than, you know, peers who've like met in school or around the neighborhood some, because you obviously, you need a reason to become friends with someone from an older generation in a much different world. Unlike, you know, like, oh, people your age, it's a given you would be friends with them. And this, um, it's um, set in um, Switzerland and I believe it takes place in a little bit in um, Italy too. And maybe at time it's, I'm sorry, it's been so long since I've read the book, but I do know at least um, part of it is in Switzerland. I'm pretty sure part of it takes place in Italy and there's this one I'm um, seeing that was very like memorable for me like somewhat near the beginning on um, Peter's mother dies and he's like you know sitting on the bed with her in the early morning comforting her and talking to her as she's passing I think she's been sick for a while and his father is really furious when he wakes up and discovers his wife has died obviously he's like upset about losing his wife too but he's like oh Peter how dare you not get a priest for your mother's last rites and let her die without that I mean is that really the the first and only thing you're thinking about and basically you know Peter has to leave home after that and like find his own way and his path to enlightenment and such. Number three, Narcissus and Goldmund by Hermann Hesse. Published in 1930, this is arguably his greatest novel. It's set in medieval Germany and begins with the story of the friendship between two rather opposite guys. Narcissus is an intelligent spiritual monk and Goldmund is his sensitive, worldly, artistic pupil who eventually leaves the Maria Braun Monastery to wander about Germany. Later on, Goldmund returns to Maria Braun after many adventures, and one of the like, key things during this book is um, Goldmund's quest to create like a, a dream Madonna, the um, Virgin Mary, and, you know, artwork just like reflecting like the absolute perfection. He won't be like content with second best. It just has to be like the most like perfect artwork ever and like while he's you know going around Germany to like you know get inspiration for this and such there's one moment that has really you know stuck with me and I've used this concept in several of my other books even my um book Little Ragdoll part three is called The Conjoined Twins of Agony and Ecstasy and this um scene is mentioned in the book um with one of the characters in the book um Emmeline who is like very very strongly based after myself I've said she's my doppelganger with a few like minor differences like for example I only wish I went to Vassar and my you know other things like that were not totally you know the same but obviously you can like read more about that if you buy the book or like watch the video I did on the background well anyway um Goldmund watches a woman giving birth and he's like struck by the way her face looks he's it never before like considered there could be such a similarity between you know great agony for you know giving childbirth and the woman the face of a woman in ecstasy during obviously having like a sexual experience and he's like trying to put like that kind of face into his dream Madonna that he's creating and just so many also really cool like interesting things in this book I would highly recommend it and it also takes place during one of the um, outbreaks of the Black Death in Germany and you know Goldman is quite you know a ladies man he goes around you know having lots of you know women friends and like you know kind of he's not you know like a bad dude like using women he's just you know has a lot of you know sexual experiences after he leaves the monastery and that too like inspires his art and his own own path and life and such and I you know again can't wait to have all these books back so I can like finally reread them after so many years and do proper videos on them for you guys if you're interested in learning more about Hesse. Number four The Glass Bead Game by Hermann Hesse. It was boring as hell to slog through barring the poems and the three live stories at the end which are excellent and very fast-paced totally up to Hesse's usual what I expect of him. But I did like the friendships portrayed. That was perhaps its one saving grace and I didn't even like really figure out what exactly the glass bead game is or how it's played and many other readers have said this as well. It seems like the Nobel Prize he won for this book I believe in 1943 maybe. He wrote it in 43. I think that he won the prize in um, 46. It was one of those times where it's more you know like a lifetime achievement award for like all your entire body of work like for example when um, Mary Pickford won the best actress Oscar in um, 1929 for the film Coquette that's really not a good 
film at all, but you know, many people feel this, this, um, award was given her because like she ha really had done so many wonderful movies before this. And uh, this was like, you know, like her first sound film and the first time she had been, you know, obviously they were just starting the Emmy Oscar awards. And so this was, you know, like the first time she could have like, been like eligible for any of her movies. And so that was obviously the only one there for that year. And so they gave it to her even for that, even though it's kind of subpar because she was like a really great actress and had done so much wonderful work before that. I think that's something similar with Hesse and the, the Glass Bead Game, because this is really not a book I would recommend save it for last like I did. I wish Hesse had spent more time showing us the friendship jo Joseph Connect shares with the old music master at his school, Father Jacobus and Plinio de Signori. Although I didn't have much sympathy for Plinio when he bitched Connect out about how he still nursed a grudge on account of their growing apart. Like they had been best friends and really, really close for a while. And then, you know, they suddenly, you know, had different like things and motivations and like priorities and such in life. And they weren't even living in the same area anymore. And like Plinio got upset because they're not, you know, best friends anymore or not even as close as they used to be. And it's just like, he's nursing this grudge all along, you know, like this was bothering him for 20 years. A lot of friends grow less close over time, and it's not deliberate or meant as a personal slight. Like, move on. And I'm sorry if there's a no an annoying noise coming from outside. My window faces a street, and I can't don't really have much choice about when and where I film when I'm not in my own house. So that's another long story too. Number five, the key is lost by Ida Voss. I've raved about this book several times on my blog. It's perhaps my favorite of the late Ida Voss's books, and arguably her best work. I just love the gentle puppeteer Amici Infante, an old family friend, the protagonist Ava, and her younger sister Lisa. After being hidden in a number of places, the girls are finally smuggled to his house in an ambulance and spend the rest of the war with him. He's so fatherly and sweet, and insists they call him Mr. Ami, since Ami is French for friend. During the brutal hunger winter of 1944 through 45, when the Dutch people were freezing and starving and had to eat, you know, their beloved tulip bulbs and sugar beets and stuff. It's just like, you know, they had like almost nothing else to eat for like many factors came together. Like, for example, Europe's most brutal, coldest winter in like at least 20 years. And like the Germans shut off like fuel shipments and stuff to punish the Dutch for trying to welcome the allies during the unfailed um, operation market garden and things like that. So it's just like a really cold, hungry winter for the Dutch people, you know. And so uh, Mr. Ami goes without food so the girls can eat until a neighbor finds out what's going on and makes him eat again. He's so hungry, he, you know, passes out. He wants the girls to have his food, just, you know, things like that. And there's also another moment in the book. There's a, a puppet show. Well, obviously Mr. Ami is a puppeteer, and we, shortly after the girls come to hide with him, he tells him, you know, puppeteers have a special magic that protects children. And Lisa lost her doll. I'm freaky. I'm hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's some F R E E K I E. Maybe it's freaky or freaky in Dutch. And um, she um, lost him when the family had to go into hiding. And um, Mr. Ami is like so like sad and like upset about this. He immediately sets to work on making freaky too for Lisa. And anyway, there's this um puppet show and um Ava and Lisa are you know doing the puppets and there's some um, Nazis and I think there's some N N S beers too, which were like the Dutch Nazis, they come in and Lisa is like so like so scared and terrified. She, you know, totally passes out behind like the the puppet stage. And so um Ava finds some like Nazi puppets Mr. Ami made, you know, just in case like of emergencies like this, and she like, you know, puts it on her hand and you know, does like the, the Nazi stuff to like fool the people in the audience and they really, really like it and she basically saves the day and like afterwards, um Mr. Ami, I believe, yeah, Mr. Ami is wanted too, like he didn't volunteer for the um like mandatory labor service for men of a certain age. And so if the Nazis catch him, he's going to be a dead man too. And so basically when the coast is clear, he, you know, comes out and, you know, helps um, Lisa. Ava is, you know, like kind of like stroking her like sweaty forehead with the puppet she has on her hand. And, you know, he like comes to the rescue so many times. It's just, you know, such a wonderful, wonderful book. It is um like middle grade, maybe lower YA, but it's like the kind of book and um, people of all ages can like and appreciate for many different reasons. Number six, The First Circle by Alexander Isayevich Solzhenitsyn, my favorite writer and one of my heroes and one of my literary idols. 
This was my introduction to my favoriteest writer, barely 16 years old, on the day I got it out of the library and began reading it was December 29th, 1995. So this was like not not very long at all after my um, 16th birthday. I turned 16 on December 18th, 1995. It's such an amazing and intense experience with so many friendships between the Zeki, the, the prisoners, at the Shrashka, the research facility in the Gulag system, which is basically the first circle of the title. Obviously, it's based on... Dante in the um, in a Sharashka is like really not that bad at all. You have like fairly decent food and living conditions, and you can like have access to books and such like that. So like compared to the like the hell and you know the Kalima and the out in Siberian actual gulags, it's you know like kind of like limbo in um, Dante's Inferno. And I did um, win the unexpurgated um, copy of this book in a, when I won a short story contest some years ago for something I wrote on my blog. Unfortunately, that also is in storage. I didn't have a chance yet to read it, but I'm really looking forward to it. If I ever get my books out of storage, hopefully some friends who still live in Albany will be willing to help me, even though my brother stabbed me in the back and doesn't want to help me. Number seven, Thérèse Philosophe, probably by Jean-Baptiste de Boyer, Marquis d'Argen. I was introduced to this awesome book through the generous excerpt and discussion in Robert Darton's The Forbidden Bestsellers of Pre-Revolutionary France, which I do have. Some books um, were um, shipped to me when my before my brother betrayed me when he shipped all my um, irreplaceable um, notebooks and journals and such for my um, storage unit back in Albany. And luckily, that was one of the ones that was in there. It's like really, really good. My All my books, I believe, from the um, Enlightenment history class I took at university are there as well, and a few other Enlightenment era books. Mr. Darnton classifies it as philosophical pornography, which is basically erotica with a heavy enlightenment message in between all of the solo and partnered sexual activities. Therese has great friendships with surrogate mother figures Madame C, Madame Bois-Laurier. The radical priest Monsieur Labbé T is also a great friend to both, both Therese and Madame C. And this is one of those books I know like huge chunks of by heart because I've read it so many times. And it's also one of the Easter eggs in my own books. There's like references to it in every single one of my books, both, you know, actual like discussing and like naming the book and like just talking about a little of the things in it. And both like the phrase, um, the richness of the choice, like I'll often have like a line like um, name lingered long and hard over the richness of the choice or overwhelmed by the richness of a choice. That's a line from the book. I probably shouldn't like say the context it comes in. It's very, very naughty. This like book is, you know, like not for like children at all. It's like very, you know, like R X rated, but you know, there's a purpose to it. You know, they're talking about philosophy in between all this, you know, sexual stuff they're doing. And it's just you know, like the priest, you know, he's like totally like a, a radical. He would be like excommunicated if people like in the, the church authority knew what he was really saying. Like he's saying like, oh, God would only have to destroy the devil and we would all be saved. There must be a lot of injustice or weakness on his part or, you know, everyone agrees God knows what will happen throughout eternity. But, they say, even before it happens, he has foreseen that we will betray his grace and commit these same acts. Thus, God, with this foreknowledge in creating us, knew in advance that we would be eternally damned and eternally miserable. <laughs> but, oh, but he, I mean, I don't think he really, like, believes, believes this stuff because, you know, he, at one point he says, like, um, can such a, th like, thing be, like, reconciled with the infinite goodness we know God has? You know, what a contradiction, what a monstrous impiety. So, you know, he's kind of like, like, theological angst, like, in addition to these radical things he's saying, he is, you know, at heart committed to his faith. He just wants to, you know, like, reconcile some of these things that don't really seem, like, un really seem fair to him or anything like that, because obviously it's the Enlightenment and people are questioning a lot of things. Number eight. The Chosen by Chaim Potok. It's a bit slow moving by modern standards, with a lot of historical background delivered via long monologues, and it's also kind of a, a really boring baseball game that opens the novel, but I guess if you like baseball, that might maybe won't bother you as much, or like just reading about any kind of sports. But it's still a classic story of a friendship between two boys from seemingly different worlds. Rayo Vane is modern orthodox and wants to be a rabbi. Well, Danny is Hasidic and wants to be a psychologist instead of inheriting the dynasty from his father. All that matters is that they have a deep soul connection, which endures even during a very difficult separation. I did reread this book some years back. It was just as good. And there's um, this, a sequel called um, The Promise, which continues in the early 1950s with a whole new set of conflicts. But again, there's, you know, the 
continuing stuff, like when Danny is torn between what his father wants him to be and how he has a genuine passion and calling to be a psychologist, um, the boys fall out because um, Danny's father is, you know, very religious and he doesn't believe the um, state of Israel should have been reestablished after the war. He obviously he doesn't oppose like people returning from diaspora or even people who always lived in the land, even like during diaspora, because um, believe it or not, um, the Jewish people have had a continuous presence in the land of Israel, even though most of us were in diaspora. So don't believe like the modern historical revisionist claim. We just like magically appeared out of nowhere in 18th century Eastern Europe and have no indigenous connection to this land. It just like came there for absolutely no reason like whatsoever. But anyway, their, their political views are different. And Danny's father doesn't want him to associate with Reuven anymore because Reuven's father is like a, like a major Zionist and like raising money and just like bo booming up the drum and, and stuff because he's like so excited the state of Israel is finally reborn again and like so he basically doesn't want Danny associating with them and Danny kind of you know goes along with it but eventually the boys do like finally happily reconcile and their friendship is like stronger than ever when they do finally get back together. Number nine, Judy Delton's Kitty series are on the four books in it. It's a shame only the prequel is still in print. This is such a charming, cute, fun, sweet middle grade series about a Catholic girl growing up in St. Paul in the 1940s. Kitty falls between her very opposite best friends, super religious Margaret Mary and rebellious Eileen. Margaret Mary wears a scapular and goes to daily mass, while Eileen plays confession at home, making up plenty of sins, and refuses to take an oath to see only movies approved by the Catholic Legion of Decency. In the last book, Kitty in High School, Kitty learns the value of tried and true friendships. Margaret Mary and Eileen are there for her when her new friend Mimi turns out to be not so perfect. And this had a lot of like influence on me, uh, many things in my own books or first drafts of books I wrote around this time that were drawn right from the, the Kitty series. And I didn't even like, you know, remember this until I reread the series like many, many years later and said, oh, that's where I got this from. And like, because I was that classic kid who like, read too much and understood too little. There were a lot of things in the book I didn't really understand were Catholic only things or even like, you know, pre-Vatican II Catholic only things. Like, for example, I thought movies in the old days were rated A, B, and C instead of the ratings we have today. And I, I realized, oh, that was just like a thing for like Catholics and like C movie, a condemned movie that wasn't like an across the board, like R-rated movie for everyone. It was just like if you were a devout Catholic, that was something you were supposed to avoid and other things like that and like for example when they're calling the substitute teacher who comes in when their um, nun teacher has to leave school I think she's sick or something like that and this teacher is pregnant and like that's a huge um, surprise well obviously she's married given that error but all the girls are surprised oh wow a pregnant teacher so this means like this teacher is married and she's called the lay teacher I didn't understand what lay teacher meant like oh a, a lay person so in other words not clergy I didn't I thought you know that was like just an old-fashioned word for a substitute teacher you know just so many things like that when you're that kid who reads too much and understands too little I would highly recommend this book it stood up very well for me when I reread it as an adult it's just you know such a wonderful wonderful series I can't recommend it highly enough number 10 Anna is still here by Ida Voss this book is set after the war and features a touching friendship between the 13 year old protagonist and an older German woman Frau Neumann. Anna's parents aren't yet able to talk about how they survived and where they were, and Frau Neumann is desperately searching for her young daughter, Fanny. Together, they're able to bond by talking about the past and their hopes for the future. And initially, when Anna's parents discover she's been like going over to this older woman's house and being friends with her, they're really, really angry because all they see is, oh, she's a German woman. And then they find out, oh, well, she's a Jewish German woman. She's one of the good Germans. Why didn't you tell us this, you know? before and they encourage her to keep going over there to like talk about things with her and just you know to have that comforting energy of someone who lived through the war in her own way because her parents just you know aren't ready to talk about where they are and they're like very like psychologically damaged from what they experience and there's one scene where um, Anna's father Simon throws a huge fit in a bookstore because he discovers like Nazi or NSB um Dutch Nazi um filth in the bookstore and like the Bookseller gets, you know, in trouble for like selling these disgusting, like racist, anti-Semitic hate books and such like that. So it's also re really interesting to like read about people who didn't want to immigrate to another country, like after the war, weren't even in a DP camp. They, you know, went back to their 
home country or they like never left the home country because, you know, they were just in hiding and they just, you know, came back to a new house or their old house if they were lucky enough to get it. Um, Ida Voss from based, um, I think she had um, five books, if I'm remembering correctly, by their um, middle grade um, slash, um, like, I guess, like upper middle grade slash lower Y a books and they're all based very very strongly on her her and her family's experience during the war in one book she even gives um the parents and the two sisters the exact um same um birth dates as her own family so that's just something really interesting she and her um little sister were reunited with their parents thank god in real life so obviously her books you know aren't going to have like a really really dark edge to them with you know like parents who are like dying or something like that i'm um, probably the, the yeah the darkest of her books is um Dancing on the Bridge of Avignon, where the family is making plans to go to the south of France, but, you know, they're um, betrayed. The person who is, you know, going to you know, help them get to safety, he, he turns out to be a fraud or something like that. This was based on a real story. Her parents, her family was also on that list, but they, I think it was her mother usually. I mean, I don't mean to, like, be stereotyping, even, like, you know, positive stereotype, but often it's, like, a woman who, like, sees through things, and, you know, has this, like, moment of sense and clarity, like, this, I'm smelling a rat, things, uh, this, like, is too good to be true, like, I'm really, really suspicious, and her, I believe it was her mother who, like, smelled a rat and got the family off the list, and they were thankfully spared what the, um, the Yong family in the book goes through, and, you know, they're, like, you know, taken to a police station, I'm, my, in my book, um, and Jakob Flo, the fiend away, is also very inspired, and some of the scenes from things in um, Mrs. Voss's books, um, particularly the one scene where they're being um, marched to the police station and um, dancing on the Bridge of Avignon. And, you know, there's, but that book, you know, kind of like ends like in media recent stuff and the epilogue, short epilogue doesn't really explain what, you know, happens. But I guess that would be like the most like mature, like a kind of dark of her books. But even then it doesn't get really too dark. And again, I would highly recommend um, Ida Voss's books. Um, four of them, to my knowledge, have been translated into English. There's actually, um, The Key is Lost, which I mentioned earlier, is a sequel to a book called Black Swans, White Swans. And unfortunately, that book is only still available in Dutch, to my knowledge. But you know, it, you can totally like it and read it and understand it without having the background information of the first book. So um, thank you very much um, for listening. I really do appreciate um, seeing, um, you know, comments and new subscribers and stuff. I'm looking forward to getting to no, my new subscribers and thank you very much for watching and please um consider liking sharing and subscribing i really do hope i wasn't rambling too much so see you very soon thanks bye